and welcome to 21st Century Vitalism. I'm your host, Brett Kane, and wow, I did not mean to uh, call the future with my last intro, and I said, um, yeah, things were going to get crazy, so buckle down. Um, and then I think it was literally the day that it released that, uh, yeah, a bunch of insurrection at the Capitol. Uh, I don't want to get too much into it because I know that that's what the rest of the world is talking about right now. But uh, I just really want to mirror what I said last week and that like, yeah, this is potentially what the new normal looks like. I mean, maybe not to the same degree, but a lot of novel nuanced situations are about to be at our doorstep and it's really important that we stay aware but also stay present and find practices that keep you grounded in your current experience. I, I do think that it is important to be uh, mindful and connected to the, the society at large and to kind of understand the different narratives that are uh, circulating but I think it is also important to know where your own um, nervous system is at, and if you need to take a step away, there's no shame in that. Um, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. If you need to get away from social media, um, do it. I, I definitely advocate. What's most important is you in your current moment, your relations, your community. Uh, are you taking care of yourself? Are you eating well? Are you sleeping well? Um, what are you doing to help mitigate stress? There's a lot of different things out there, um, a lot of things that this podcast is a proponent of, um, and actually what this episode is kind of largely about. Um, so yeah, just uh, be gentle with yourself. This is a year of developing uh, kindness and compassion for yourself and for the other people around you. Uh, chances are, if you're listening to this show, then you already have some level of interest in, um, I guess, being the change or um, in just stepping deeper into yourself and your body and what it means to be human. So I would encourage you to cultivate the attributes that would make you a beacon of peace. Um, right now, there's a lot of chaos in the world, and we really need as many um, ambassadors of peace and calmness that we can possibly use, you know, there needs to be a counterweight for a lot of what we're seeing. And, um, you know, it's up to us to be that in our communities. Um, if you are barely managing, then do not worry about how you're showing up. Um, it, it's okay to rest. It's okay to um, go inward. Uh, it's okay. Whatever your re responses is natural and valid. Any anxieties you have are very just and reasonable. I just really encourage you to take a moment, take inventory of where you are. Um, and maybe, you know, I mean, I'm not doing this just to like wrap the podcast, but today's episode is honestly a perfect dive into a practice that could be very beneficial for you in these coming years. So take it to heart, really um, explore different modalities of peace in this life because we're really, we're really being called to stand up and be more than what you know prior generations have had to be um so if this resonates with how you're feeling or where you're at then this is the episode for you uh today i have uh the incredibly wise casey must coming in from uh detroit citizen yoga she is uh the founder of that organization as well as the host of the uh after class podcast which is a brilliant podcast on everything in the world of yoga and we really dive into what yoga is uh, in the 21st century. I, I really liked her approach and her value system in setting up her business. And we really dive deep into what it means to be a yogi in this in this century and what exactly yoga is and how you can actually approach it, even if you've never really had a keen interest in it. Um, we really break it down in a very contemporary and secular way. There's no dog dogmatism in this, and I think she's a very strong representative, uh, a very wonderful embodiment of what this practice has to offer, truly. I am absolutely thrilled that, and honored, honestly, and humbled that she was able to spend some time with me, and I, I really look forward to connecting with her again. Um, yeah, this one, this was a great episode. I, I, I really enjoyed myself, and as I was re-listening to it while editing and picking out the themes, I just had another bout as like a listener rather than host of just like, oh my God, this being is uh, so needed, you know, and the fact that uh, they're so accessible, um, you know, they have an on-demand program right now where you can plug in 
for not a whole lot of money. I think there's even like free sessions that's offered. Um, don't quote me on that. I, I, but I think, um, I think that's possible. So now is the best time while we're in lockdown. If you are spending more time at home, give yoga a try. Truly. It it is a beautiful practice and it's going to be an integral pillar of what this show is. Uh, when I start the Patreon, this is going to be something that I offer. I need to get accredited first, but, um, this is going to be something that keeps coming up. So, um, yeah, without getting too into it, um, yeah, Casey Must from Citizen Yoga. Uh, if you feel like supporting the show or supporting her, um, give us a like on Apple Podcasts. Give us a five-star rating. It really helps us rise in the algorithms. Um, follow us on Facebook. Uh, subscribe to YouTube. Like, comment, whatever it takes. I'm going to find some easier ways that are maybe more beneficial to help out and show your support and get involved and let me hear your voice on what you want to hear from the show. Uh, you know, this is a open source kind of deal. So while I may be the host, you know, this is all of our conversation and I, I encourage you to get involved and, uh, offer your wisdom. I, we, we're all, we're all being asked to step up. So, uh, yeah, I encourage that. And as for supporting Casey, if you want to head on over to citizenyogastudio.com, you can actually check out her on-demand service or her podcast, which I said before. I think it's also on Spotify. It's the After Class Podcast. Really, really brilliant. I, I really suggest it. But without further ado, please open your hearts, open your ears, drink a nice cup of tea, do some asanas. Uh, welcome, Casey Must. <laughs> Casey, hello and welcome to 21st Century Vitalism. Uh, thank you so much for your time and being here. I really appreciate it. I, I can't wait. I love being able to see your face. Technology is so amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's the truth. Yeah. Maybe one day all the listeners will be able to get in on this experience, but this is uh, just for us to be able to say hello formally. I love it. So the reason that I wanted you on here I mean, not only do you have an amazing platform with uh, really awesome content that is really enriching to literally a lot of different kinds of people, I think that that's something that kind of drew me to you over other yoga teachers um, Mm -hmm. was the accessibility focus that you have. Um, But I I, I just, I really like your candor. I really like the way that you express. And I, I thought I could trust you in helping me and my listeners kind of come to terms with what yoga is oh there's god a, i know there's a lot of different <laughs> oh, opinions god. and viewpoints but i i feel confident that we're going to be able to draw a wonderful map for people to have a better idea um so to start us off i was just kind of curious uh getting like a broad overview of what it is that we mean when we say yoga like there's a lot of ideas about it but starting with like a brief history like what exactly are we talking about how do you- so if you go to a um, Western yoga class that's, you know, more exercise based and somebody's gone through a 200 hour training, the first thing that you'll hear described as yoga is a union, which is true. Um, there is a joining, a uniting that I think we all as human beings are seeking. There's a very essential part of us that Uh, we reconcile and sort of wrestle with or try to reconcile and wrestle with every single day, which is an experience of a a void, an inherent void that uh, nobody should feel ashamed of. I have it, you have it. And the journey of like a true sort of asana practice is um, using the physical body to help you along the path to develop a more embodied state, a more aware state of your physical form, your breath form, your intentional form, um, in order to not feel so compartmentalized inside yourself, to not feel like you're just this body that sits over here, then there's maybe some breath and then there's a thought, but that you're actually this moving mechanism and particularly to humans, you're a moving mechanism of choice. And that is the differentiator between us and animals is that we have this incredible capacity to choose. And so yoga has, um, there, there are different schools, of course, and I don't mean asana schools. Um, there are different sort of branches of ways that you can take the spiritual path from all different directions. But those are meant to give you scaffolding 
to help support you taking these equipments that you have, making them function optimally, make them feel like they're a whole machine or a mechanism to get you, I don't even want to say out of, because that would be a rejection to something, but a remembering that as much as you feel like there's a void, there's an inherent wholeness that you already possess that you just have forgotten the memory of versus like find the self. Okay, well, where is the self? It, it, does that mean it's outside of me? No, it's inside of you. So, you know, that's really a maybe a longer winded way of saying that yoga is not just physical movement. Yoga is a combination of using your body, your mind and your intellect um, to get to the root of uh, what what's creating your world, to get to the root of like how or why you suffer, to get to the root of your own personal expression, to get to the root of how your ego identifies. And then once you use all that to sort of dissolve it. But that's mm. that's that's how the traditions are sort of laid out for you. But it's a really long journey. And I think one of the biggest, one of the a false promise that is made to us is that insight is an instant thing. And there is nothing that is instant about an insight. And so that is a good yoga practice is it's sort of a long journey, a good pilgrimage um, inward instead of outward. Hmm. In the uh, B- uh, Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there's a word called bhavana, which is mm. gradual cultivation. And it really emphasizes the idea of patience and playing the long game. I mean, a lot of Buddhism is. That's kind of my philosophical background. I wouldn't say I'm a Buddhist, but I draw most of my inspiration from that. So I think that kind of does point to the truth that in order to create this sense of union within any of the practices that I talk about on the show or anybody practices, it's it really is kind of like the long game, you know, and it really is through that that vehicle of patience that we actually understand the greater depths of like who and what we are. Yeah, because um, you can take the idea of yoga and make it really macro and then you could like really sort of find like really – Uh, like fractalize it and get really micro about it and say okay well yoga is the union between this moment like the the future in the past and the mind finding this present moment and that's a union of the mind to this moment and that's a yoga in itself so it doesn't have to be so overarching like spiritual end game it can also be the uniting of you back to your present present self so it doesn't have to be so overarching. It can also be a very modern day um, practice in the for productivity, for success, for self understanding. Do you think that having the idea of an end game with a practice like this is uh, beneficial? Because I mean, coming from where I, I'm learning mindfulness meditation through a gentleman named David Nickturn, who's pretty accredited and kind of the thing that keeps kind of get, getting re uh, cemented is that like the moment you have an end goal is the moment that you're kind of like away from the present moment because you're living more in the future is there ever a situation where using an end goal is actually kind of a benefit to the practice um that's a complicated question in a in a good way uh because there's so many different ways you could answer that uh there's um uh, acceptance commitment therapy uh, there's a guy, John Evans, who works, uh, he's on our on-demand platform, and him and I on our podcast talked about the difference between goal setting and values and how you live your life. Um, I'm a very achievement-oriented person that has given, sort of plagued me with anxiety. Uh, so it's like, you know, somebody who likes to rise. I don't mean like up a ladder or something. I mean like energetically rise um, and seeks constantly. There's like a little discontent and obviously more anxiety. And so if I'm constantly thinking about a goal, which again has like sort of a very specific target, uh, then there is anxiety because the mind, the moment you have a desire and the desire puts you into the future because it it starts to modify. It says, am I going to get it? Am I not going to get it? I mean, that's basically anxiety. The mind going either into the past or the future, moving at a specific pace. And when you're goal oriented, it's a very specific outcome. Um, And so the mind will naturally have a little bit more anxiety and a little bit more fear. Whereas uh, when you're more values based, I call values living like a long term. It's like a long term living. 
this is what gives you patience because the success of values living is it's day by day, step by step. And as long as you're going in that direction, you're in, in quotes, successful at it. And you feel good. Like there's a, a spark of inherent joy that comes when you uh, f- are doing the right thing, when you're following what you should be doing, what you ought to do. And so when spiritual seekers become very goal oriented and we were actually talking about this because i think of it as not just goal oriented but this is the right way this is the wrong way anytime you become overly polarized uh, you immediately create more stress and your opportunity for union or wholeness that actually is just not possible and so you don't think of it as like okay okay if your goal is the self but it's a high we call it a higher ideal And an ideal is, it's like your true north, but you can get to north by taking so many different paths. But the more you're like, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna go north by taking telegraph. You have to get to telegraph. And then you have, okay, well, what if, if you're going north on a neighborhood road, you have all this anxiety, well, I'm not on telegraph. But if your goal was just north, there's um, not that it isn't hard and effortful, but there's a greater ease and it permits the mind to be more in the present because there isn't an, a tr- what I would call like transactional spirituality, transactional relationships. So that's, a, John and I speak about that quite a bit about the value of a value, the value of living by your values is incredible. And that's really what spirituality hopefully helps people do, not give you a goal, but give you some values. Wow. I really like those distinctions. That's kind of something that I've always kind of maybe struggled with within my own practice and life path is like the differentiation between, you know, like being present and content with the current now moment and still striving for things. And mm-hmm. for me, it's kind of like always being on the cutting edge of your capacities is the destination. So it kind of becomes this like positive feedback loop where it's my destination is just to make sure that I'm on the outer edge of my comfort zone and like constantly pushing forward while also not like putting off my contentment into some future um, like state, you know, Mm. and like that just allows you to be more open and vulnerable with the the world while still, you know, being content in that moment, you know? Well, this is like such something I totally, I I can relate and I wrestle with. Um, Funny enough, my husband, he and I talk quite a bit about this, which is, you know, inherently in my nature i am a more discontented person there is a drive that i sort of like can't help it's like it's like been programmed inside of my cells and it's hard to conceptualize contentment and drive at the same time contentment and clarity at the same time but i think at times we mistake including myself mistake indifference to contentment like being indifferent or not having a direction is not being content. Content is the acknowledgement of your circumstances of the past. It's also understanding where you sit. It's it's not gratitude. It's in some ways devotion. Gratitude is more of a me focus. I'm blessed because I have this. That's still in some ways a self-centered focus, which people hate hearing that they're self-centered, but welcome to spiritual conversation. Um, It's a devotion to something that's bigger than you. And so being content is you acknowledging that all the past effort you've done and you can't change it, that you have a capacity to choose in the present moment. So, okay, like I'm doing my best. I'm here. I'm looking forward because my ideal is there. And at the same time, I already have so much. And most of us, particularly in the West, feel so empty, like we've been given nothing (laughs) in our lives. And there's so much that we've been given. Like, I would encourage you to really look at like, okay, well, what are all the things that you've been given? You have air. We used to not be able to walk. We could walk without a mask on. You know, there's so many things that you take for granted. And so these these two things, contentment and drive forward, they, I think that they have to live together. And that is a very complicated relationship. Yeah, and I'd also say that like, 
to actually have a real genuine sense of contentment, you have to be able to hold the things that are in your life that are kind of ailing you. I mean, the idea of being content almost always implies that there is something weighing you down that you're able to kind of be with and accept, you know, and I, I like that differentiation between contentment and um, uh, what's the word? That Indifference. You Indifference. And I'm kind of curious because I feel like a lot of people who are on the outside looking into yoga or any other spiritual practice for that matter who don't yeah. feel that natural inclination to take this effort on. They see it as effort. They see it as work. Some people have said it's labor. Like how are we able to explain to them that, I mean, the indifference is actually creating the conditions for all of their their life, you know, like that apathetic state. Like how do we instill a sense of it is good to embrace things. Should we even be trying to do that or should we just only be speaking to the people that are already kind of in our own sphere, you know? There's kind of like a gate around a lot of spiritual practice that I would love to see kind of softened a little bit so people can be invited yeah. into it. There are so many questions in that question. Yeah. Uh, there are so yeah. many questions in that question. So first and foremost, yes, it, it, one of the accessibility and intimidation is definitely there and no question it, it the gate has to be lowered and at the same time in spirituality there are guardians it's like this is not for the the faint at heart this is not going to be an, an instagram pill you know and there is nothing that is glamorous about a true spiritual path it is arduous it is difficult it is fighting with the dragon you know sleeping beauty style you know like getting into trying to rise to a higher state of consciousness and if every if everybody understood well i the the comment on work is very fascinating to me and i want to sort of like put that aside because i think we have a very uh if we can reframe how people look at work i think that that will change how they think of spirituality but i will say that it is arduous and it burns and it tests you and so if you don't want to, don't. And this is the biggest thing, is that in every spiritual book that is truly spiritual, that is a from a teacher who understands, is uh, Ramathirtha said, you must raise yourself by yourself. Nobody can do the work for you. Doesn't matter. And so we, if we all have that perspective, it's not to say that you don't need good stimuli around you. Uh, it's not to say that you don't need good people around you, because if you think, which all people think, that they have this control over sense objects, like they can turn it on and turn it off. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, I'll just, you know, do this at another point, but I totally have it under control. Then you're, you're wrongly assessing how much support it takes to travel the path. And it takes a lot of support. And it's not just like-minded people. It, that if you're just around like-minded people, I mean, that's part of our issue in our country. You don't want to just surround yourself with everybody on your Facebook feed that's like-minded. Um, and don't get your news from Facebook, please, God. Um, <laughs> but it's so important to have questioning. I was just explaining in our philosophy. So I lead philosophy classes multiple times a week, and they're for everybody. It's not for one type of person. You don't have to be an expert. And I was describing to them that the true spiritual path is learning how to question, not learning how to answer. So if you can really refine your questioning skills, what you're actually doing is you're probing into your unconscious in a way, and that is difficult. Like when you do asana, most people do asana how they prefer. I prefer to do it like this. You don't know you're doing that. Your body is doing that. Your muscles, we, we call it muscle memory. We're not trying to practice with muscle memory. We're trying to practice with good angles, with a teacher, with adjustments, with props. You're doing all of those things so that you're not just following the natural tendency of the mind. And so for people who are uninterested, great. Stay uninterested. Like the reflections that are found, there's so many reflections that are found in philosophy to help you get out of your suffering. And suffering is not pain. And you'll know this from a Buddhist perspective. Suffering is, it's an angle, it's a lens. You could look, we could look at the same circumstance, have the same experience, and I experience it as suffering, and you experience it, maybe it's pain, but you experience it completely different. 
So when you understand that the spiritual path might be full of some pain, growing is painful, changing is painful, but it's not suffering. Because there is, um, I, I don't love this word, so I apologize if somebody, you know how you have like words that you hate in like the English language, but like when you do something hard and something becomes rigid, you need like lubrication. And having a higher purpose, establishing an ideal, reading spiritual books, whatever that is, it doesn't, it could be Brene Brown, you know, like she's spiritual, she's trying to make people feel connected. That's not the person that I follow deeply, but you know, again, it could be anything that makes you feel more one, more whole, more interconnected, not just with other people, but yourself and inter our being that like, I am one with something that is spirituality. That's, that's what you're looking to do. And that's not easy. So when somebody doesn't want to do it, keep suffering. And, and it's, and it doesn't mean that it takes away the suffering. So there's no, again, there's no instant insight, no easy fix. Yeah. Yeah, and I think something that I've kind of picked up um, by doing my own yoga practice and kind of brushing elbows with a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds is that, I mean, everybody's version of spirituality is different. There's no one universal. I mean, and it kind of goes back to what I said about being on the cutting edge of your capacity. Um, so like kind of like the idea that you're in a yoga studio and you're doing a pose as deep as you can go and the person next to you is doing it 10 times deeper. It doesn't make them necessarily like a better yogi. That's just where their capacity is at. And if you're at your capacity, then you're still in that same boat. It's an equal thing. So the people who might not be actively pursuing spirituality, their ability to still experience things as oneness, which it, it happens, they just might not have the right contextual lens for it. Say like sexuality or being at a concert, those moments, I mean, I think over time will kind of erode that barrier between them and what spirituality is, you know, and it's just a natural process of coming home and having more and more life experience. Yeah, there are two, there are two um, pieces to that. One is, is like that false sense of love and light crap. That's very yeah. nice. Yeah. You know, like that's not actually, when I moved to India, it was horrible. It was yeah. terrible and I was miserable half the time and I was a worse person. And, um, you know, when you pressure cook your mind and you don't, you, you know, take away all the things that you're comfortable with for three years, you go through a deep transformation. So this idea that like there's love and light everywhere, like that's that's not that's not really helpful. Um, and in terms of asana practice, what's really helpful to think about instead of thinking about capacity, to think about what are the objective measures you can use in the physical form to learn to fit yourself better. So you're not trying to fit a pose. You're trying to use angles in your body to fit yourself to yourself. So my armpit fits to my knee, not your knee. So when we say that yoga is for all bodies, it's because you have specific proportions for your body. And guess what? If your body doesn't fit, it's not something to take personally. It's something to examine. What have I been doing? Oh, wow. Like recently, I'm like biking a lot more. I'm like, whoa. My hips are not fitting. Okay, there are things that I'm doing in my day that don't allow me to fit. Well, if I want to fit, what do I do? I have to like continue to work these specific things. So I think in asana, it's not just about deeper. It's more about how good is their technique? Are they, are they fitting themselves well? And I think that that's how in an asana practice, you really can do more of a coming home. That when you feel like you're not missing something, that like the yoga pose that you're trying for or striving for is out there and it's somewhere else, but it's actually in you. It's like in a right angle. It's in how your collarbones are meant to be because you're a human and it's your proportions and it's not anybody else's. So asana, it's not a one size fits all. It's a universal fit principle fits you in a personal way. Wow. I really like that. That's really good insight into that kind of nature. Um, so what would you say to people who haven't gotten that close to yoga, who 
um, we were talking about like a lot of like the love and light stuff. And I actually am a pretty big um, proponent of calling it out. I was that person for a few years uh, when I first started getting oh, into this. Oh, me too. Oh, it, for sure. In my 20s, part of I was a total, no offense if anybody's listening and you say that. So please do not take anything I say offensively. Sometimes it can be a little snarky, but I'm only snarky because I was that. And I was a total quacky. I was like, I've been everything. So yeah. I've, yeah. I've sort of gone through the, the, the ringer of pseudo, what I call pseudo spirituality, yeah. confusion, um, mind and too much emotion and too much like do what you feel. Yeah. And then like you find knowledge that makes sense. So, yeah. 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 And I don't think that there's any shame and I've definitely been in no, positions. No, no shame where I have tried to shame people because it was like right when I like got out of it, I was kind of just like a little high and mighty and kind of doing the same thing, but right. from the opposite side of the coin. And um, my lineage calls it spiritual materialism. It's kind yep. of like an extension of just you're just shopping the spiritual things and using that as a coat to kind of reify the ego in another way. Um, mm. But for the people who are on the outside who see a lot of this, um, and they're just like, I do not want to get involved in that. I could probably really benefit from this practice, but everywhere I go is just re of like, they're just in that, that space. How do you, how do you invite those people in? So that's why we created our on-demand platform. I think that, um, yoga culture, I I've been practicing since I was 10. So I don't remember what it's like to, I do know what it's like to be on the outside of an experience. And I put myself in uncomfortable situations. Like I went to a rock climbing gym like for the first time in a long time, I was like, oh, what makes me uncomfortable about this? Like, how do I feel? Like, I know there's a culture here. Um, skiing, like skiing so uncomfortable. Like you have all this equipment and you don't know what to do with it. And like, do my boots fit? And am I going to fall in front of all these people? And so I think that one part of this is to, for people who are very integrated in the yoga industry, to put yourself in more uncomfortable situations so that you can remember what it feels like for somebody um, who doesn't have a regular practice, what it might seem like from the outside. So that's that's first if you're from the inside out. Um, but our on-demand platform is really, it was accessible financially, but it's also accessible in the length of videos and what we offer. But it also in incorporates mental health. And I would say that um, you have to start where you're most comfortable. And I also would say that The yoga, the yoga industry in a lot of places can be, how will I say this? I've seen a lot in 26 years and it can be really toxic. And so what they are seeing, what they might not want to participate in, that might be a real thing. And maybe you don't have to participate in that. But there are a lot of really great studios out there. And your first step is to realize, one, that it's, um, you don't have to do the spiritual stuff. You can move your body. That is totally fair. And either way, the practice will have an impact. Slowly, you'll be a physical person. Then you'll be a breath person. Then you're going to be a mind person. Then you're going to be an intellect person. And then you're going to be all of those things. And you're going to say, holy shit, I'm having an insight. Yeah. Oh, I get this, you know? And that takes time. It does not take just effort. It takes a long time. Um, and so if people are resistant to the industry, I understand why. Uh, I think it's it, there's a lot of there's a lot of bullshit out there, a lot of like uh, misinformed philosophy. Um, that's why I love my teacher, my teacher Swami, one of my teachers. Again, I, I really work hard to remove any dogma and rightness as much rightness as I can from my teaching and on our language. Um, but Swami Parthasarthi is who I studied with in India. And um, I find that his philosophy books make it practical. They're almost more like psychology books than they are like, seek the self, seek the self. Of course, Swamiji says, seek the self. And when you listen to Academy lecture, that's what he's talking about. But there are books like Fall of the Human Intellect or Holocaust of Attachment that really take, dismantle the fluffy sort of flowery language that has been written in all these books and just says you have a body you have a mind you have an intellect this is how you use them learn it like you would learn how to use your toaster oven in your kitchen and you'll have a better life guaranteed whether that life becomes spiritual or that life stays material either way you'll find more success yeah 
I don't know if I answered your question, so you can refine your question if you want me to no, push I think that it that, from a that, different that angle. Covered it up quite a bit. And I'd also just add, I mean, for the people who are on the outside looking in, you know, I think you, you did touch up on it. Like, I think shopping around, you know, if like you genuinely want to pursue this practice, don't let one studio or community put you off if it's not your vibe, you know, like there's plenty of people out there that are offering beautiful practices, you know. It's, yeah. And, and, and the one thing I would say is like, the, the idea that you don't practice because you're too inflexible. I, like, I can't even fight that statement anymore. I, I understand if you looked at me and you saw me, you'd be like, okay, like easy for her. Mm -hmm. You know, I came from a mother that looks exactly like me. Um, but I can tell you that it's not about your flexibility. I have so many spots where I don't connect in my body, even after 26 years. And you might see, feel like I do, but I don't. And so if your idea is like, I'm not flexible, most of that comes from like shame of not measuring up. And that's something just to look at. Like what else are you avoiding in your life that like you're just missing out on because you're uncomfortable or you're afraid of what people are gonna think when you do show up. And so I do think that, that one of the positives of 2020 for Citizen particularly is the accessibility, the ability to have your camera off or have it on, uh, your ability to be on demand or be live in person. And hopefully what that offers people is more compassionate space to explore unknown parts of who they are. Yeah. I actually, I mean, I point out pretty regularly on the show, like the positives of the pandemic. And it, there's a lot of negatives. I'm not trying to downplay it or <laughs> yeah. cover it up or make it flowery. But I think the virtual offerings that people have stepped up to be able to expand their business ideas with, I think have actually been incredibly beneficial. And I could totally see for yoga, the fact that you offer like a cameras off kind of approach. I think people are in their cocoon, like their house for this year is essentially a cocoon. And what they're gestating into is based on like their choices, but having these offerings and these abilities to be not seen and to just express themselves and explore themselves in that way, I think is going to be huge. And I'd love to see it go forward. Mm. You know. Yeah, I want to clarify one thing, which is, you can start with your camera off, but slowly you one day have to turn it on. Okay, so okay. our 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 mission is to see each person and is that if that's uncomfortable for you then like you can start with your camera off but one day you turn that thing on so we can help you and watch you and and be present with you and again i totally get what your point was because i think that that's in the beginning of your journey especially if you are afraid or maybe sometimes you need to be introverted i'd keep my camera off when i need to be more introverted um but i do think that there's an accessibility the other positive of this experience for me has been the opening of the borders uh, is is um, in the yoga industry there is a lot of sort of stick with your tribe there's a lot of tribalism in the different schools and within different studios within different communities and i think that for the certain people who wanted a little bit more freedom it's opened up our borders to take different people's classes and really connect uh, with each other. So I think that that would be probably my other 2020 love is just how much accessibility now I have to so many other people. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of an interesting thing to hear uh, from someone who's like inside the industry, so to speak, that there is like a level of tribalism. You'd feel oh like that would be like the last place that there would be in group, ah! you know, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have so, response. yeah, I don't know. I mean, I grew up in a very dysfunctional yoga community in Detroit, and um, and I speak very openly about that, and it taught me a lot about who I did not want to be. That yeah. is the best way to describe it. And when I moved to India and came back, and I realized sort of how vacant the teachings were based on real philosophy that the that the actual practice is based on, that was one of my biggest separating moments and and again it's not to criticize it's to understand that where people in the industry make a wrong move is they think business is separate than teaching that is the that is the yoga studio owner's mistake that is the yoga teacher's mistake that your business should be run with the same values that you teach your classes with and if you can't do that then what yoga are you living and that is where values 
versus goals. I have a goal to open a studio. Well, what values is it based off of? I like teaching yoga. Okay, that is not a value. Yeah. That's a goal. And so then you open a studio and you're confused as to like why there's gossip and drama and insecurity and disconnection. So our industry is plagued with this. And that to me is, that was the reason, one of the reasons I opened Citizen, but really it was for mental health and and, and carrying on tradition in a very modern, less dogmatic way. That's honestly what drove me to your platform as well. How did you uh, instill your value system into the operation of your business? Because that's something that, I mean, I think having a solid blueprint for other people who are wanting to go down this path, I mean, we say that, but for them, it's like, I don't know even what that means. Yeah. I mean, okay, for, well, one, higher ideal, sit down, write out, why are you doing this? And usually why you're doing this is from your darkness. Like what darkness? So my higher ideal is suicide prevention. My sister took her own life in 2007. I struggled with my own depression, my own anxiety for my whole 20s, um, the whole decade. <laughs> um, it was a very interesting decade. And uh, out of that darkness and confusion and sort of purpose arose this vision of a real community uh, a yoga studio where people felt seen and connected with and of course we don't do it perfectly we're humans you know so you have to understand that like yeah somebody might walk in and you might not see them and then they have this experience like I went to that studio and I was unseen okay of course there's human error but I started with an elevated platform and what do I mean by that it wasn't for me I didn't even want to do this. I honestly, I did not want to teach yoga as an I, as a career. I did not want to own a yoga studio. I didn't. I do not want to be a famous yoga teacher. Like, no, thank you. Um, so I don't. My end game was like, okay, I love business. I love creativity and strategy. I I I know philosophy. I know that my teacher has taught me that consistency and cooperation and concentration create successful endeavors. So like, okay, and I need a higher ideal. I had all those things. So I started with that. Then I wrote out like I had my personal mission. So you understand personal mission and higher ideal can also be interchanged, but it has to be deeper than like I want to teach yoga to help heal people. Uh, it's, uh, first of all, you can't heal anybody. So let's start there. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, what a false sense of like control over somebody else's journey. Really, you get in to offer guidance, to offer boundary, to hold space. But what they do with that space and how they like elevate themselves is, is theirs. Um, and then you, over time, really... Our biggest value when we started was alignment. And the way I define alignment yoga is an ability. It's really to the extent your your higher ideal, which is a thought or a desire, matches your emotion and and then runs through your body. How How many actions per day? What percentage of your actions per day help you get to your higher ideal or directed towards those values and what percentage are directed towards yourself and acquisition and enjoyment of your own self. And to that degree, you'll sort of see your, either your business rise if, if it's aligned with something or it won't. And that takes a lot of discipline, a lot of effort, constant effort. If you know me, I, I, I sort of like I'm an incessant type of human. So I do think it takes sort of like that level of intensity. Um, so don't open a business if you don't have this intensity because it is intense and it is really, really hard. Uh, but the thing that, remember I was telling you about that lubrication, like on those 14, 15 hour work days, which is usual, uh, there is a joy. Teaching to me is like oxygen. If I didn't teach classes, I would feel emotionally deprived. So when I walk into the studio, my job is not teaching. My job is running citizen yoga my privilege is teaching yoga classes like that is like my true joy so i start we started there um in the detroit community there was no alignment yoga it was flow how you feel vinyasa so we pioneered like thinking and questioning and and exploring asana practice like forms have meaning they're not just about your feelings so that was first and then integrity um 
integrity is what upholds alignment. So if you have no integrity, you have no alignment. So like I think of integrity, if you were trying to build a, a, a building, you know, it's like, I don't know, maybe it's not built a building, but it's like all the scaffolding around the outside of the building that keeps it together. And then community is our next value. And I wanted a community because I felt so alone, honestly, in here. And my family was very, very, um, I apologize, this is a little long, but my family was very broken after my sister passed away. And actually up until this past year, um, and I would could go on and on about EMDR. So if you one day want to do something with mental health professionals in EMDR, please do it. But so I, I did build a community more for myself, but I knew a community doesn't arise without alignment and integrity. Community is an effect of the right cause of alignment and integrity. So you can say as a business, oh, we have community because you have people who come in. That is not a community. That is not how community is created. Community are people who actually care about each other, who talk to each other, even if they're strangers. And that's something that you have to work at. You have to train adults to socialize. We as adults do not know how to socialize with each other. We're afraid, we're transactional, we're insecure. And so what you have to do as a leader is you have to embody confidence. You have to show people, you sort of, like that's what I always say, like I sacrificed this like sense of self uh, what's the right word? Self, um, it'll come. Preservation? No, yeah, not preservation. Um, like not insecurity, but it's like uh, like self-criticism. But that's not that's not what I'm trying to say. There is a word, but it'll come to me. Okay. Um, in order to create a community. It was like I just like put my ego on a tray and burned it and felt uncomfortable all the time. I literally walk up to you and be like, hi, Brett. Like, I'm Casey. You're like, who are you, lady? And like, that was it. You know, you're like so awkward with me. And I just will hold space for that awkwardness. Many people don't even like doing that. And then our, our last two, and I'll go quickly, our support, which is a call to action. So the first three are to support you. The, the fourth is a call for you to support others. The burning of the spirituality, like the inconveniencing of your life for others. And then the last one is inclusion. And um, there's so much in that, that it, it's a whole other conversation. But when you manage, when you make decisions, they have to go through all of them. Every decision, is it aligned? Does it have integrity? Does it create more community? Is it supportive to our staff, to our people, to our students? Is it inclusive? And I don't think we've done inclusive. We're, we're trying to like sort of like work against the industry of yoga, which is not very inclusive, which is ironic um, and sad, but we're working against it and, you know, change is possible. Yeah. So that's what I would say to people. Yeah. There's a few things that I wanted to reflect on. Um, the first one that you said was a little bit ago about the idea that like teachers are not healers. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a licensed massage therapist, and I feel like if there were any profession that were to consider themselves healers, and we're also plagued with a lot of the same issues that the yoga industry is plagued with. There's a lot of um, kind of love light, but also like genuine pseudoscience that actually profits off of people's pain and then promises them things that it can't possibly achieve. Um, so like the idea that like healers, I mean, he healing is done on your own accord. Like, I don't know what your healing thing is, you know, like I could just create a container for you to come into your own internal processes in the same way like yoga, I feel like probably also does that you're creating a container for people to come home to themselves and to like bear witness to where they are. And it's the bearing witness that will naturally start a chain of events that actually leads them down their unique path. Mm. Whereas I feel like a lot of people who step into the healer role, they'll apply their unique path onto other people. And in psychology, they call that counter transference where the therapist mm. starts projecting their own internal processes on their their clients and i just think that that for me um i live in grand rapids michigan and I've, i love uh, grand rapids it's great i've explored great. a lot of yoga studios though and i almost always run into this wall i don't know what it is about this area and i'm not saying it's everyone but I would just really like to challenge both massage therapists and yoga teachers or anybody in a position of power, any, where there, there is a power dynamic, you know? A hundred percent, there's a power dynamic. 
every word you say implants a psychological structure into people's minds, especially when they're deep into their bodies, you know, and oftentimes you can really exacerbate a latent traumatic issue or even create, you know, pathologies that might not have even been there, you know, Mm -hmm. and I just really like to challenge people to, I mean, the way that I'm going to be getting my yoga teacher training this upcoming year to benefit Mm -hmm. my, um, my massage therapy. And I'd really like to stick as close to the clear instruction as possible and like that's just something that i'm seeking in a community as well is to like maybe get like the personal bias out of there like personal story and conjecture is important and that imparts the experience and the benefits of it but the instruction is the the vehicle that will help people do the thing they need to do Mm. um and Mm. what else was there i mean that's that's like a big well that yeah but you know the second the idea is like you know, so in another school that I'm I'm studying with, you know, they call in Katona Yoga, they call, you know, they refer to your body as a house and you have three floors. And the first floor is like your basic needs. I also think of it as like your sleep, your sleep, your unconscious. Your second floor is like how you're teaching. And as a teacher, we live on the second floor with people. We don't live in their third floor. We're not their insight. We don't go up there. And then you could relate it to the chakras and you could, there's so many other aspects to this that then like the philosophies really like, they weave together so beautifully. Um, But as a teacher, you're not their insight. You don't give people insight. The insight comes from technique well-practiced. Technique well-practiced becomes somebody's truth. That means that multiple different techniques could become somebody's truth. That means there isn't one absolute truth, even if somebody presents it like, well, this school of yoga, because this is what I lived in, this is right. That's not... That's not it. Yeah. So what do you think? I mean, I don't want to like overgeneralize because I'm sure there's a lot of nuance to this question. But like, what do you think is a typical like condition that causes people in positions of power to want to be someone's insight? Like, where does that come from? Is it just kind of like um, trying to like live a grandiose, like be more than what they may actually be? Or like, what what is that? <laughs> I mean, okay, so think about motivation. What are the two motivations of human beings? What are two things that people want? Um, this is clout. Okay. And uh, shoot, I don't know. Um, food. <laughs> okay, I like it. <laughs> That's the two things in that me. <laughs> that I like that. Two things that people want that are this is like from um, Shankaracharya wrote this long, long ago, but acquisition to acquire and to enjoy. So if somebody has power over another human, you're acquiring name, fame, wealth, power. These are all things that the mind wants. The mind is an insatiable fire. And it you can say, I will be happy when. And this is something to continuously reflect on. And this was one of the, my favorite things that my teacher said which was never peg your present happiness on future acquisition. I did that as a kid or like, oh, I'll be happy when I'm 30. I'll be happy when I'm 25. I'll be happy when I'm out of school. I'll be happy when I have a kid. I'll be happy when I open a business. All these things that people say to themselves, which is not true. It is 100% not true because you can't see that once you get that thing, the mind is satiated, but the mind can never be satiated. So it's just going to expand. Sense objects have uh, an enjoyment What's a, uh, an, like an enjoyment. Like lifespan. Com- yeah, life, thank you. A lifespan. You can enjoy something without restraint. And so what happens, there are a variety of things that happen. But one is, is that there's a false promise of fixing and healing in the industry. And it's because if you promise somebody, if you come to my class, then this is what you get. Or you get attention or you feel like your void is filled. I get more money, more power. That's what people want so that they can enjoy their lives. And especially in an industry particularly that was a non-money maker for many years, um, you sacrifice your dignity and (laughs) values to get what you need from it. And then once you realize, like you don't even realize that. See, there, there is no way that somebody who's, they might still think they're doing the right thing. Right. But because somebody who's deluded can never know that they're deluded. Yeah. 
Yeah, I feel like the moment that you question within yourself, like, am I taking advantage of people? I mean, it's uh-huh. probably a, a good indicator that you're probably not, you know? Mm-hmm. I think, like, if you yeah. have that wherewithal. I mean, there's probably some Maybe. situations. Or you have a blind spot and you need to fix it or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's a good um, point. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to... Uh, reference in what you were saying is um, in regards to your values manifesting in your business and how you every uh, choice that you make ends up going through the filter of all your values how has that actually shown up in your operations of citizen and like how does that show up in each individual class and what do you think makes citizen in that regard different from other what you would consider like the more toxic yoga communities Um, yeah how does that what does that look like um, oh, if Morgan was on this call, she has so many examples. She works with, she's been working with me for so long, um, or Shannon, like our whole team. I think first and foremost, um, your values live in your internal community. So I base the health of the company on the pulse and the relationships that people have within the company. And that doesn't mean that we haven't had misalignment people come in and out of the studio. That doesn't mean we haven't had gossip. That doesn't mean we haven't had that stuff. But that stuff can't stay in a healthy environment. You'll know the quality of your company when we're misaligned, and we have been at certain times or certain months. Like when we're misaligned as a company, people who don't have the same values that we have stay longer. And then they sort of fester. But the moment that the like the guides, whatever that is, is that your admin team or me or whoever it is or all of our teachers, everybody aligns. Those people feel that and they leave. So I would say that the way that I know it's happening right now in the company is when we go to our staff meetings, that pulse of the group is phenomenal. How people share appreciation for each other is really incredible. In terms of class, everybody's themselves. So like there isn't, yes, we have like a standard pace, but I wouldn't say that there's like a standard, we're not trying to make you a robot. We're trying to help you find your own self in this teaching because it's like language. Everybody speaks English, but we speak English at a different pace with different you know, idiosyncrasies and different ways we say words. Teaching yoga is like that. Um, so I would say that alignment for sure but it's not rigid alignment integrity you'll find that like people are really trying to be authentically themselves as much as they can and offer the thing that they know is best for you even if they're still in ignorance you have to hold two thoughts together you can't know everything right so what i offered in the beginning of when i own citizen isn't the same does that mean i was out of integrity no i was just functioning from like what i knew then that doesn't mean that it was out of integrity. It just means that like, hopefully as you grow as a teacher, you learn more. Um, and then, you know, I think community, we always say, um, I grew up in a yoga culture of noble silence and I absolutely hated it. <laughs> um, and I always felt like everybody was uncomfortable. People were awkwardly sitting, nobody was talking. And I think that from a mental health perspective, we need conversation. So we always say our noble silence is conversation. So when I walk into a room, and it's loud, like to before class, I'm like, temperature check. Mm-hmm. I'm doing a good job. That's how I gauge it. Like, okay. And then, you know, there are other aspects to it, but there's also, you know, management. Our, our performance reviews are based on these values. Um, and then when somebody sort of like goes astray, we manage them through these values. So instead of being like, you didn't show up for work, it's like, okay, how would, like, okay, this is this is the value of support. How could you have functioned more supportively to, let's say it's a front desk person who doesn't show up for their job. Instead of being like, what's wrong with you? Like, why didn't you show up? It's like, here are three more ways you could have been more supportive. Call the teacher with more notice. Say, hey, I have a flat tire. I'm running late. Don't just run late and not call anybody. You know, then post in the Facebook group. Is anybody going to be at the studio? Like whatever that is. So we don't just manage from good or bad. We really try to like reframe values and like redirect, not reframe, redirect people towards values. I like that a lot. Um, So with inclusivity being one of the values, um, this is something that I think uh, is probably going to be one of the hottest topics in the yoga industry because I feel like, 
a lot of the times when you see any yoga related things in media or it, whenever it's represented it's always a kind of a monoculture it's usually I mean, especially in movies and stuff it's usually white women you know and they're like late 20s or so like coming in with their skinny. chai lattes yeah. skinny so like skinny. how do we how do we change this because I, I, I don't think it's going to be up to movies I think movies are going to I think if anything they're responding to a stereotype that might have a little bit of truth at the current standing how oh it's we... 100% true yeah yep even like as a male who wants to pursue yoga, I mean, every class I go to, there's usually one for every 10. And, and it's like, it's something as basic as brushing teeth, you know? So like, how do we really instill that and change the conversation and invite more people in when it's been so monoculture the, in, for a lot of its time here in the United States? Um, so I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, you know, the resurgence, I've talked, I've spoken on a lot of podcasts about the resurgence of Black Lives Matter for me was um, probably the most intense moment of 2020. Yeah. Um, it's actually really difficult still for, for me to talk about it. And I think that the one thing I will say is that change happens from the inside out. And you can't just put, you can't start from out there. You have to start in here. And I think that that is what Citizen has done and is continuing to do, whether people know about it or not. Um, and I think that that's the first step is, is the acknowledgement. See, my teacher taught me that anytime you're aware of something, it automatically starts to correct it. So that correction has already started to occur um, in our community, and I can't control anybody else's community. Um, one woman who's incredible that everybody should go read her book, Dr. Gail Parker. Uh, she practices at our studio periodically when she's in town. Uh, she's an incredible woman. She uh, wrote the book, and it's very recent, but it's um, healing ethnic and racial trauma through restorative yoga. And I might have switched words. I tend to be a little dyslexic sometimes, and how I rotate things, but nonetheless, um, that's her book. And uh, we added it into our 200 hour training and she uh, tells her story in it. It's really amazing. And I asked her way, I mean, before, way before 2020, I said, Gail, like, what should I do? Like, how do I get, you know, cause she said to me one day, like, you know, I just want to let you know that I've been in a lot of studios and I feel the most comfortable being in your studio. And like, that's a really good job. And um, but still, she, you know, uh, people of color were very underrepresented in our studio. And I asked her, like, what do I do? And she said, put somebody who looks like me at your front desk. I was like, okay, like, that's helpful. And um, I think for me, my blind spot was quite large because I was really focused on mental health and community, but didn't really think about what's outside of our borders. Like, okay, what else exists? I was like, okay, the inside needs to be perfect. But like, okay, well, it, I, I wasn't, I didn't have a bigger context of how I was relating to the world. And I think that that's what 2020 has opened up for me uh, personally. And I think in the industry, this is about longevity. This is about taking action again with um, true, what they call shraddha, one of my favorite words, like your ability to start something and finish it to the end, your ability to embody a goal your ability to embody an ideal, your ability to embody something day to day and finish it. And I think that there was a lot of like initial effort and then like a lot of quiet and we're continuing and slowly chipping away and looking at how we can be inclusive because the stereotype is not a stereotype, it's a reality. The one thing I will say about, I would actually say in our Detroit studio, um, my last class I taught before we shut down recently in November, um, I was I was so like reflective in the middle of it. It was half male, half female. Again, uh, capacity is limited, it's 18. Half male, half female. Our Detroit studio tends to be more male than any of the other studios, which I like, absolutely love. And it was extremely diverse. And I was just like, wow, okay. Like we're moving in better directions. We're not perfect. We haven't gotten anywhere that far, um, but it definitely is a better direction. So, you know, you have to start somewhere. And I and I don't have an answer. 
I guess is my question my answer is that yeah. I haven't figured it out myself and I think that that was what was so painful one of my best friends she's a clinical psychologist also um, she's been doing like uh, diversity work our entire best friendship <laughs> and she's like hey get on the train now hello I'm like oh yeah and she said the thing that you hate the most about this is that you can't do this well like you can't just fix this with, with effort like you can't just do good and she's right like it was like oh I can't just fix this today I can't just put effort in it, it's going to take reflective work not just doing work yeah. so yeah I like that a lot. Long answer, to, long answer to that one. That was, it's a, it's a harder. Yeah. Well, I it's mean, a, it's a, it's a question that doesn't really have an answer. So I mean, the yeah. length, I mean, I think is fairly justified. If not anything, it's a little short, <laughs> you know. And yeah. I, I think um, one of the practices that I've heard, I'm a really big fan of uh, Zen Roshi named Joan Halifax, mm -hmm. and a lot of her work is by sitting with the dying. And one of the practices she points to into like really holding that space is. Um, not knowing and i think that right now um for like the work that you're doing and i think the entire community should really lean into that not knowing and i think it's through that space of kind of open curiosity rather than mm -hmm. definitive action that we're going to slowly start inching this um this bubble to be more inclusive you know and i think like it's not going to be something that one person does that like you can set the example with your studio, but it, it's going to be something that, you know, other people are going to learn from your studio and then they're going to do different things. And like, it's going to take this receptivity and this full communal push. And maybe it'll actually be one of the major things that helps, um, kind of end parts of the tribalism, or at least lessen mm -hmm. that thing yeah. to where we can all join a greater community. And if we all actually start leaning into making this inclusive, living by the actual values that yoga puts out there, you know, I think is, it's going to be massive. Mm. Yeah. So I just advocate, I think uh, you're probably, you're doing a great job, you know, just based on your interpretation. <laughs> I think I'm doing okay. You know, I should just say like, it's our value in progress. That's how I should list it. I think that's a better way to list it. Value, like the other ones are, are actualized. They, they're functioning. I'm just going to put like a caution tape around that value and say yeah. value in progress. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the honesty is a big part, and I think that that actually reflects, like, the greater culture at large. You know, 2020 hit us all really hard, and, like, it. I also went through some stuff, and it was a matter of, like, how could I have been so blind, you know? Yeah. So I think that we're kind of reeling as a society, and, like, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who are just, like, actively defensive and, like, kind of aggressive to the idea, like, what do you mean racism's still a thing, you know? Like, but I yeah. think it's it's a matter of kind of feeling bad you know there was like a lot of guilt that kind of came up and I'm not saying that that should be the main point of conversation like our guilt is ours to process mm -hmm. but I think it does have a psychological impact that we're all navigating together and yeah um, everything's in progress you know we, we don't have the answer if we had the answer we would have figured it out back in the 50s you know mm -hmm. with the original civil rights movement but mm -hmm. clearly there's an element to this that we still have to soften into yeah, I would encourage people to have a lot more compassion and try not to express their frustrations on social media, yeah. but to actually reach out to the source that you're trying to change. I would say that that would be my my only sort of frustration with the experience of it is like, I'm not talking, I, I'm actually specifically talking about a few instances. So understand it's not a comment about the whole, but sort of the social media shaming and um, massive sort of, there, there are good things to call out. So I want to sort of say that there are good things to call out to people. And there are, you know, what, that's the impact of a whistleblower. That's the impact of all these things that we need to like drive to the conscious surface. But I also think that, um, giving people a compassionate benefit of the doubt and understanding that there are people who do want to change and reaching out. I always say like, reach out to me directly, like, that that to me is more powerful in eliciting a, a real change, a real answer. A good friend of mine runs a company called um, Yoganic Flow, uh, and it brings yoga to the inner city in Detroit. She's incredible. Um, her name is Carrie. She's on she's on my podcast. Her and I did an episode on the paradoxes of the yoga industry. I just listened yesterday to that. Oh episode. yeah, <laughs> she's she's awesome, right? Yeah, she's great. 
she's special and you know i think she has given me such a space to have real conversation with her and 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 speak openly and and feel uncomfortable and and that's not her obligation her and i have a friendship now yeah. so that's different it's not like she's a stranger to me but she's she's a very profound person so i highly recommend people go check her out on in what they're doing but yeah i mean it's it's voices unheard and we have to give space for voices that need to be heard and and i and i hear that and I really believe that and hope, you know, hope, hope, hope that, you know, our teacher training can produce teachers who look different than me um, because I am that stereotype and um, it makes our community even more vibrant and more welcoming that, you know, and I can only, that's in time. I can't just make somebody a teacher instantly, um, but in time, um, people will be ready. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think doubling on the, the social media approach to education. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, like, shame is often the most primary thing, and I think it kind of comes down to people's inherent shame within themselves that they just get it boiled over. But, like, I think the most successful conversions, if you will, are when you're like, hey, can you reach out to me directly? I don't want to, like, lambast you publicly, but, like – let's have a conversation, you know, like let's, if you're, if you're open to it, but you have to invite them into it, you know, and there are yeah. definitely some situations, like you said, that are like, absolutely not, you know? Yeah. Or just, or there's times that you need to blast people, of course, but not casually Yeah. because you're bored on Instagram and have nothing yeah. else to do. Yeah. You know, uh, again, I think that, you know, there's a poem, uh, it's called Turkey and the Ant. And it, it essentially, the message of the poem is like, we're also focused on everybody else's blemishes, that we miss our own blemishes that are like a thousand times worse. And if that isn't the message of social media and this year, like, I don't know what is. Like, you you have enough work to yeah. clean up inside yourself. Yeah. Like, let's be clear. Like, I have a whole shit pile of stuff that I need to, like, get better, do right, you know, and hopefully... Uh, that that's what I that's for me what I'm focused on like what can I change in my you know direct reach because that it just it's the same question you asked me like can I can I help people do the work like yeah. yeah you can point them like Jen over years my close friend from DC you know she was like I'm going to this meeting I didn't even care it's not like she didn't tell me it's not like I didn't care it's just again it, I didn't have that awareness and then all of a sudden like a trauma hits and you're just like holy shit why didn't i do that okay well you weren't in tune so let's do it now that's what happens to people that's why they come to yoga the holy shit moment don't do it wait don't wait for your holy shit moment get prepared learn about your body learn about your mind you'll feel so much better in your holy shit moment that right there i think is where we should probably end it because i think that that kind of summarizes the importance of yoga in the 21st century yeah exactly that's really yeah yeah Awesome. Well, thank you. Casey, thank you so much for your time. I understand that you're very busy, and it means a lot that you're able to sit down and uh, have this conversation with me. I think this is going to benefit you. a lot of people. I hope so, and, yeah, I, I'll always come on here. It was so such a good conversation, such thoughtful questions. I really appreciate thoughtful questions. So Wonderful. I hope your listeners, you know, get something out of this. Yeah. And for the listeners, if you want to share with them how they can uh, stay in touch with you, I know you have that on-demand platform. We didn't really talk about much, but okay. it does look comprehensive, as well as your podcast. Yeah. If you want to plug. Yeah, so um, my studio, Citizen Yoga, citizenyogastudio.com. Um, we launch a new on-demand platform. Our app is launching 2020, January 2021, so I don't know when this will be released. but um, And so you can download it on your phone. It's $18 a month. Uh, we did it to be accessible so there's real therapists on there educating you about your mind and what you can do and different forms of therapy we have breath coaches meditation etc and yoga obviously and fitness and um you can find me on instagram i'm i am citizen yoga and also citizen yoga and lastly yeah our podcast is after class i have lots of episodes um with different guests and it's super fun so thank you I didn't realize you had actual therapist. Like, that sounds so cool. I wish we would have talked about yeah. that, too. <laughs> yeah, we have real therapists it. that are on there. And wow. um, so, yeah, we can do another one on mental health. I would love to answer any questions, how we relate mental health to philosophy. Cool. So awesome. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much.
All right, friends, so that was the episode. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. I genuinely appreciate you. Um, I know I say it at the end of every episode, but like truly, if you made it this far, thank you. Thank you so much for your support. Um, Yeah, that was Casey Must. She's, I mean, as you now know, just incredible being so like i said at the start if you want to help support her do her on demand uh program uh if you do uh citizenyogastudio.com all of the uh, respective links will be down below really give her a podcast to listen to um, absorb some of her content she's got an awesome ted talk on youtube uh yeah she's got she's got stuff out there and all that will be down below so thank you so much again for listening and we will see you next week wednesday at 11 a.m